Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I usually prefer to speak still and just standing up, but I have given up caring at this point in my life. I'm just going to sit down. Okay. <laughs> um, as, I, as I mentioned to Archcoms, uh, okay, today I officially reached full term, so I could go any minute. But it's okay because I know there's at least one nurse in the audience. Okay, so um, this is the, the spiritual reflection of why truth is important. I mean, Michelle has spoken very well on how truth is important for avoiding confusion and avoiding people being misled and spreading lies. But there's a much deeper level to the idea of truth than that. Um, and it, so we're going to go back to why the theme for this year's World Communications Day was fake news. The first question is, did you ever think about why the church has got World Communications Day in the first place? Or you just think like, oh, we got migrant day, we got this day, we got that day, so we have to fill up the calendar, right? Well, it's a bit more than that. Um, World Communications Day is the only worldwide celebration that Vatican II called for. Hmm, sorry, that wasn't loud. Um, and that's because when the bishops met for the Second Vatican Council, they looked at how the world was changing. The world was coming together with modern means of travel, communications, you had airplanes, you had radio, you had television, you had satellites. So all of a sudden, the world was much, much more connected than before. And seeing the potential for both good and evil, the bishops established World Communications Day to remind us to communicate responsibly. And not just that, they also wanted to be able to use everything for the greater glory of God. So even something which we think is secular or worldly, like media, can be used in a Christian spirit for the salvation of souls, right? So 52 years after Pope Paul VI inaugurated the first World Comms Day, some of the evil fruits that the bishops were concerned about have grown even more obvious. First is the deliberate spreading of lies. Another is the slanting of news to provoke anger, to provoke nationalistic emotions or prejudice and the withdrawal of people into comfortable little echo chambers where they only hear what they want to hear and they don't have to expose themselves to other views which might challenge their own assumptions. So some of these fruits seem very modern. But in his letter for World Comms Day, Pope Francis actually traces their roots all the way back to the dawn of time, to the Garden of Eden. Even there, there was fake news. Who do you think created that fake news? The Satan, right? He appeared as the serpent so that he could provoke the fall and provoke the inheritance of human sin which mars our world today. Because he knew that Adam and Eve were created in perfect friendship with God. Um, so he knew that they would never consciously choose evil. So how can he get them to do evil? The only way he could get them to do that was by putting a pretty face on an evil choice, on disobedience. So as the Holy Father puts it, okay, this, is, this is the text from Genesis. Although I'm, I'm sure that you're all familiar with that because all Catholics read the Bible, right? <laughs> um, and so the Holy Father explains in his letter, first, the serpent approaches Eve by pretending to be her friend. He pretends that he's only got her good in mind and he says something that's only partly true. He said, Did God really say you were not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Is that true or false? What did God tell them? Only one tree, right? But the way the serpent phrases it makes it sound like, oh, 
God said you weren't supposed to eat from any of the trees. And because Eve knows the truth, she corrects him and she lets herself be drawn into this conversation, which then takes a very subtle turn. Because the woman then clarifies, oh, of the tree, of the fruit of the tree in the middle, God said, you must not eat it or touch it under pain of death. So she has allowed herself to start seeing God's warning in very negative terms. If you touch it, you will die. And she doesn't understand that it's for her own protection. She sees, she begins to suspect, maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe it's something really good, but he wants to, to remain in control of me, so he's going to tell me not to do that. And so... Satan plants a little seed of doubt in her mind and so when Satan then tells her you will not die she is relieved, she's tempted, she allows herself to be taken in and because then the serpent, the serpent then goes on to say God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil think about that were Adam and Eve already like God? They were made in his image and likeness. But the serpent got her to forget that. She forgot her dignity and she was tempted to go for something even bigger and better. And so this is one of the main points that the Pope makes, which is that there's no such thing as harmless disinformation. You know, when you start to trust in falsehood, it can have very dangerous consequences because even a seemingly slight distortion of the truth can have dangerous effects. Imagine you're driving and you take a wrong turn. If you're on the expressway, the next time you get to correct your route might be 5 or 10 km down the road. And if you're driving interstate in like the west, right, you can be 60 km before you even get to turn around. Every little wrong turn will end up taking you further and further away from your destination. And so, we arrive at the deadly sin. Remember the seven deadly sins? You, know, you all know them, right? And there's one particular one which is at the heart of fake news, and that is greed. Greed is the disordered desire for worldly gain. And so what does our greed lead us to do? Our greed for power makes us create fake news because we stand to gain. Either we stand to gain influence, political power, financial, financial benefit. And our greed for influence makes us share fake news without verifying it. You know, because on social media, it's fastest finger first. Everybody wants to be the first one to post uh, what is hot. Everybody wants to be the influencer and to be admired for being in the know. And finally, there's a greed for fame. Um, and that makes us massage the truth to create more attractive social media posts. Um, and what does that do? We lower our moral standards, we sell our bodies cheap, all to get more likes and more shares. I mean, if you look at um, a lot of there's a, new, there's a new career path, apparently, they're called influencers. And if you look at um, quite a lot of the, the young female influencers, for example, no matter what they are talking about, it, they all seem to be wearing a lot of makeup and very little clothing. So regardless of what they're actually talking about, what they're selling, they feel the need to package their externals in such a way as to grab eyeballs. In Singapore, very recently, there was a case of a photographer who said he was a photographer, but actually turned out to be a very, very good photoshopper instead. And what did he gain from that? Money. He gained influence. See? So in the end, our greed leads us to very, very superficial relationships. It leads us to social media addiction, which is also on the rise to insecurity and low esteem. Um, and this is very common amongst teenagers nowadays. You speak to social workers, they will tell you that because 
teen girls especially are so hyperlinked. They're always online. They're on Instagram. They're on Facebook. Actually, no, they're not really using Facebook anymore. Facebook is for their parents. But they're all on Instagram and Snapchat. And because there's so much pressure to put up pictures of themselves and see what other people say about them, you then have a lot of eating disorders, a lot of depression, a lot of attention-seeking behavior. And when you allow yourself to get sucked into that mindset, our minds are completely devoid of that internal space where we can communicate with God anymore. Because we're so obsessed with how other people see us and what our ratings are. No longer can we quiet our minds to listen to God. And that's what the Pope said. Constant contamination by deceptive language can end up darkening our interior life. And so here's another, here's another angle. So this is a very relativistic age where we say, oh, I have my truth and you have yours. You don't bother me, I don't bother you. And so sometimes when we point out fake news, you know, on your, on your church group auntie chat where they send you something about, I don't know, radioactive waves from the sun are coming in very strongly this week, so don't go out on the sun. Um, and when you point out that this might be fake, people will say, uh, people get defensive. I find that I find that occurs rather often if you say, oh, Mother Teresa didn't actually say such and such. Um, one very common response that I hear is, well, I found it beautiful. There's some good in it. We can all learn from it, you know. Um, and in a way, people are defensive because if they shared something, they want it to be accepted, right? So if you reject what they shared, some people can take it as a rejection of them. And so their, their egos can be pricked. And sometimes they are, they are very, very committed to the news that they've shared with you. And so they get defensive. But do you remember how the serpent in the book of Genesis cloaked his bad intentions in good words, in very sweet words? So when we defend error because it sounds pretty or it sounds attractive, it's the, really the first step down that slippery slope of thinking that it's, e it's better to feel good than it is to seek the truth. Um, but why is truth so important? In a purely secular level, we need truth. Human societies need truth so that when we communicate with each other, we're sure that we're all on the same page, that we're all talking about the same thing. When I say apple, you also mean apple, and we refer to the same red fruit and not like a durian. So we have a common ground for interaction. But at the spiritual level, truth goes much deeper than that. God tells us in the Psalms that he is the God of truth, right? Jesus says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's see. So that's God is truth, Isaiah 65. Jesus says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit, which will come down at Pentecost upon us, is the spirit of truth. So you see, the Gospels themselves tell us that each person of the Holy Trinity embodies truth. And the Gospel of John, particular, I mean, you can look, you can go through it and count the number of mentions of the word truth in the Gospels and in the Gospel of John, it occurs more times than in any of the synoptics. So truth goes far beyond whether something is true or false or right or wrong. Truth characterizes our very relationship with God. In the Bible, the way they use the word truth conveys a sense of trustworthiness, of solidity. So you think about our world, right? The world is so uncertain. We are often tossed about. We feel that we may not have any control of our situation. But truth is the firm rock on which we can build our lives. So as the Holy Father says, we discover the truth when we experience it within ourselves in the trustworthiness of the one who loves us. 
And this alone can liberate us. And that is why Jesus said, the truth will set you free. When you come to know God, you know the one whom you can rely on for your entire life. Because humans will inevitably fall short. No matter how good you think somebody is, you know, there will be ways in which they disappoint you. Sometimes completely by accident, but only God never disappoints. God is the truth. So scripture and history are full of examples of the holy martyrs who gave up their lives rather than give up the truth. Uh, if you look at the scriptural accounts, there were so many Jews and Christians who suffered martyrdom rather than worship false gods. You know, the, from the Old Testament all the way into the New. And even in the Christian era, you have many, many saints. St. Thomas More was executed because he defended the truth of Christian marriage. When the king said, oh, I want you to dissolve my marriage so that I can go and marry this other woman and have a son because I need an heir. The St. Thomas couldn't do it because it would mean telling a lie. It would mean he, he, I mean, sure, he might have the authority to say, yes, I can dissolve your marriage, but he knew it was a genuine marriage. He couldn't do it. That would have been a great lie against the truth of marriage. And you look at Jesus himself. He refused to play the fake news game of bending the truth to remain popular. But do you remember the, the Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6? When first he fed the crowds, so they all followed him. They followed him because they wanted more bread. And then Jesus told them, if you want eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And at that point, they said, Ee, doan, doan, doan. How can you say that? You're crazy. And do you remember what happened after that? It says, and many of them turned away from following him. Now, if he'd just been an influencer who wanted to get as many followers as, pos as possible, do you think... Don't you think he would have said, oh, um, yeah, I was actually wrong about that part. It's okay, just, just keep, stay with me, I'll give you more bread. But no, Jesus said, I gave you bread earlier, now I want to give you something better. I gave you bread for a day then, I want to give you the bread of eternal life. You have to do this. And although they were so disgusted that many of them turned away, he knew he had to speak the truth because he had to tell people how to be with him forever in heaven. So here is another consideration. The truth also characterizes our own relationships. As I said earlier, truth isn't just about being factually accurate. Just as how our faith in God isn't just head knowledge about what the Bible says, about what the church teaches. But because we exist in community, I exist with you and we exist for each other, Pope Francis writes that we recognize the truth of statements from their fruits. Remember what Michelle said just now? By their fruits, you will know them. So when you make a statement, it's whether they provoke quarrels, foment division, encourage resignation, or on the other hand, if they promote informed and mature reflection, leading to constructive dialogue and fruitful results. In other words, you can say a statement which is factually correct, but it becomes untruthful when it's deliberately used to hurt or to demean others. There are many ways of saying the same thing. There are good ways of saying something, there are bad ways of saying something. Um, and I think that most people are very familiar with this. When somebody you love or somebody you're married to comes up to you and says, do I look bad in this outfit? There are many ways of answering that question. Um, so, you can tell that the Holy Father is not telling us to avoid uncomfortable issues. He's not telling us to just be nice, don't hurt anybody's feelings. I mean, no. We don't shy away from talking about uncomfortable issues because there's a lot of 
pain, there's a lot of suffering in this fallen world. We have to be able to address that. We have to be able to talk about it with others. But we can do so in a way which is full of faith, hope and charity. Because only then are people going to experience Christ in our words. So, he ends off his uh, World Comes Day reflection with four pointers on how we counter fake news. And the first is, fake news thrives in closed circles. So he says, avoid cliques and silos. Because when we only hang out with people who think like us, and when we refuse to hear alternative views or alternative voices, we are much more likely to make unfair assumptions unkind assumptions too about people who are not in our group so um, for example if I only hung around in Christian circles I might get very um, I might get very misleading or very unkind ideas about say what my Buddhist friends believe because people might bring in uh, like a very prejudicial views towards them but then the more that I speak to people who aren't from my own natural circle, the more I realize that they are people like me, and the more I learn to listen, and the more I learn to dialogue, to share my faith. Secondly, the Pope supports educational programs to help people be more discerning about what they hear on social media. And, and this is not just something that the Pope is advocating. If you look at what the Singapore government is doing, they are doing that in schools now. The National Library is has got all these posters up encouraging people to fact check, to sift through what they read. Um, and actually this is nothing new. At the very first World Comms Day, and that was back in 1967, Pope Paul VI praised every serious initiative that forms the judgment of the reader to evaluate the news and the ideas which are presented to him. Because even back then, they had begun to realize that the media could present such a powerful image or such a powerful story that people swallow it wholesale. It's more intense now, but the roots of it were seen even back then. Thirdly, the Pope praises the efforts of governments and other institutions to develop laws to curb fake news. Um, as you know, in Singapore, they are still discussing um, a law about fake news. and. The challenge that governments face here, however, is to curb the spread or the effect of fake news, but also ensure that such laws are not used to curb um, the free exchange of views or the, the legitimate speech. So, I mean, this is something that Singapore is still working on. Um, this is something that the Pope says is good for governments to look at. And something else that he said that um, institutions can do is with your media and your tech companies, find out ways to verify the identities of people who are hiding behind fake profiles. Because very often, um, some of the most vicious and some of the most misleading stuff is produced behind a fake profile so that the people who produce them do not have to be held accountable for what they say. And finally, Journalism for peace. What's that? He says the best antidote to fake news is not laws or te technology because whatever man-made scheme you can come up with, there's going to be another man who's going to find a way to get around it. So what needs to change is man himself. People need to be more willing to listen and dialogue and to take ownership of what they say. So it begins with a change of heart not just um, finding technology or finding laws which will help you to curb fake news. It begins from the heart. So, speaking of fake news... <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so I have kids in school, I know how this works. They all want to know the right answers. Um, and so, this is the first one, right? Um, and if you thought it was fake, then you could put a sticker on it. So this was, Pope Francis requests that priests be given the right to get married. 
We have about 15 people who said this was fake. And they are correct. <laughs> because um, there are actually two issues going on right here. And one is that there's a possible synod going on in, in South America. And the issue is whether married men can be ordained to serve as priests. Because the church allows that. You can be ordained as long as you got married before that, but once you're ordained, uh -uh, no more. So it's not that priests can go and get married, it's that married men can be ordained. Okay, next one was... The Pope suggests contraception can be condoned in Zika crisis. Surprisingly, this one had far fewer people thinking it was fake. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and this, this got blown up in the secular media big time because he gave a press conference on an airplane. And they asked him something about, in the case of um, Zika-hit regions, right? the options which were given to him were something like uh, abortion or birth control. Now, abortion is completely out, right? It's an intrinsic evil, no matter what the circumstances. So the Pope was very clear that under no circumstances could that be considered. But did the Pope then say, therefore you can use contraception? No, he actually didn't. Because he said that you can delay pregnancy, you can space births, but that does not mean that the Pope is saying you can use contraception because there are illicit ways of avoiding pregnancy such as abstinence or natural family planning. You can abstain from sex when the woman is fertile and that's completely illicit. But he never said that, sure, you can go and use condoms or the pill or whatever to avoid pregnancy simply because there's a risk of having a disabled child. So, there, that one's fake too. But you see, what happens when the secular media hears, yes, it's okay to space pregnancies, is they instantly go into contraception mode and they say, oh, now the church says contraception is okay, maybe he's going to okay it in all other situations as well. Okay, now this one is my favorite. Italian police recover St. John Bosco's brain from teapot. Um, and this had about a dozen people thinking it was fake. Well, the good news is that is actually true. <laughs> and you can go and Google this if you want. Um, what happened was it wasn't his like, it wasn't like a fresh brain, okay? It was his relic. It was a relic of his brain <laughs> that had been stolen um, some time ago from a church. And the Italian police in some raid on some guy's house, they discovered it in a teapot. And clearly it was not a very big relic. I'm not saying that he didn't have a big brain. I'm just saying it was a very small relic. Okay, so that's real. Mm, and this one, Amoris Letizia, which is quite a controversial document in some respects. Um, and this website said, it came up with a headline which said that the Pope said that it was for couples and not the church to decide on whether they could use contraception. Um, this got about 50 people thinking it was fake. Very good, because that is true. I mean, it's fake. It's true that it's fake. It's wrong! <laughs> uh, because he never said anything like that in the document. He talks about individual discernment, but it does not go so far as to okay positions, which the church has always held. Um, next, moving along swiftly. A million Christians to pray rosary on Poland's border commemorating the defeat of Islam. We mentioned earlier that some websites, take, some Catholic websites, take a very hostile view of Islam. So anything that they can come up with to poke Islam, they will do that. So this is actually what you would call deliberate misinformation. Do you remember when the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary is? 7th of October, right. So what was happening in Poland was that they were having an event to pray for their country, to pray for like, the conversion of souls, the protection of their country, 
And because it was the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, he said, we're going to do it on this date. Now, the historical context is that the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary used to be called the Feast of Our Lady of Victory because that was the defeat of the Ottoman Empire by the ships of Venice. So what happened was, it was a fantastic battle where the Christian fleet was enormously outnumbered. They all thought they were going to die. And what did the Pope do? He asked everyone in Europe to pray the Rosary. The Ottoman fleet was huge. This is the Battle of Lepanto, you may have heard of it. And the Christians won. So the Pope declared that would be the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. But it doesn't mean that if you go and pray the Rosary on this day to celebrate Our Lady of the Rosary, that you are praying for the defeat of Islam. And in fact, the organizers of this event said on their website very clearly, we are not attacking any particular group. We are doing this because we love God. We're doing this for our country. It's just that a particular right-wing website picked it up and they spun it this way in a very hostile manner. So that is fake. Okay, last one, last one. Yeah. Pope tells bishops not to accept gay seminarians. Uh, we had about seven people thinking this was fake. And it's actually true. Um, he did tell them not to do this because... This is merely a restatement of an exist a very long-standing um, Vatican policy, which says that if any, if the seminary directors are aware that any of the seminarians or the candidates have very deep-seated desires, they shouldn't bring them in, and that is because their desires are not rightly ordered, and also because it might be a temptation for the seminarians themselves. Um, the policy, as far as I know, is that if the man has lived chastely for at least three years, if he can show that he has mastery of his desires, then yes, he can be considered. But if he's very, very committed to like, a gay lifestyle, or if it still is a very strong grip on him, then yes, the Pope says, no, don't take them. You know, it's, it's not a firm no, but it's no for now. Okay, so that is it. Yeah, I'm going to hand it over the mic back to Andre.